Hi, and welcome to Learn Linux on a Mac. I've been a Linux and Unix system administrator for 20 years, and I've worked all over Europe on various systems for universities and large businesses. My go goals for this course are to teach you two things. The first one is to be able to set up a Linux virtual machine on an Apple Mac. That means that you can use that virtual machine for testing purposes even if you're not connected to the internet. My second goal is to show you some basic commands such as how to connect to that virtual machine using SSH, how to add and remove users, and do various other administration tasks. In addition, I'm going to show you how to upgrade and update your system, how to edit configuration files, and how to browse your way around the directories and files on a, on a Linux server. Why did I choose these particular items to teach you? Well, my objective really is to, to teach you about Linux in a very short time. So in other words, to give you a taste for Linux. I'm not going to teach you rocket science. I'm not going to show you in great detail how Linux works. But by the end of this course, you should already have a system running on your Apple Mac, and you should be able to use that to do pretty much anything you want to test. I've got two main course activities. The first one is building the VM or the virtual machine itself. So you'll first of all download the software from the internet. You'll install VirtualBox and the VirtualBox extensions, and then you will create a virtual machine. Once you've created the virtual machine, you will then boot up the Linux ISO file that you've downloaded and you will install a virtual machine with Linux as the operating system. Who should take or not take this course? Well, if you've already got Linux experience then this course is not really for you and similarly if you know VirtualBox quite well then you might find that this course is too basic. So it's really for people who are complete beginners in Linux and who want to really start from scratch and have a test system up and running quickly on their Apple Mac. If you don't have an internet connection or an Apple Mac, then this course won't really be the best one for you. At the end of this course, you should have two things. The first one is a running Linux virtual machine on your Mac. And secondly, you should be able to practice lots of commands on the command line in Linux. So my only advice really is to get started and, and practice on the, on the course. The best way to learn is to actually do. So learn and do. Try and just practice the commands that I give you. And before long, you'll be fairly confident on, on how to manage a Linux system. So I hope you enjoy the course. Hi, today I'm going to show you how to download two fantastic programs, VirtualBox and Ubuntu Linux. Once we've downloaded the programs, I'm going to show you how to install them on Apple Mac, and then we will generate a new Linux virtual machine on VirtualBox. Once we've done that, we will boot up the virtual machine and just make sure that it's running correctly. So I hope you enjoy today's video. Okay, so let's first of all download the software that we're going to need. So if we open Safari, first of all, and we need to go to www.ubuntu.com. Okay, on the left here you can see that there is a server and a desktop version. So we're going to download the server version click on the download Ubuntu server button and we will use version 16.041 which is a long-term supported version LTS means long-term support and then if we just click on download it should start the download in a few seconds and you can see there's a progress bar up here so I'm just going to pause the video now so you don't have to wait for the, the full download and we'll come back in few minutes. Okay so our download is finished. So you can see that um, the software we need is in the 
downloads directory on our Mac. The next thing we need to do is download the VirtualBox software. And for that we go to virtualbox.org. We need to go to the download link on the left and we need to select the operating system that we're using. In this case it'll be for Mac OS X. So this shouldn't take too long to download. We're also going to need the extension pack and the extension pack is available for all platforms as a single file so we don't need to select a particular version. We can just check the progress on these downloads here. You can see that the extension packs already finished and we have about 10 seconds left for the VirtualBox software. Okay, so now that we have the software that we need, we can we can go on to the next section which is installing a VM. Okay, so now that we have the software downloaded in our downloads directory, we can go ahead and run the VirtualBox installer by double clicking on the DMG package. And then we double click on the VirtualBox package. That should run the installer in a second. So it ver verifies the package contents to make sure it's okay. Then we get a warning to keep our computers secure. You should only run programs or install software from trusted sources. Well, I think we can trust VirtualBox, so let's go ahead and continue. Click install. And then we're prompted by the Mac for our administrator password. It's now going ahead and installing the software. It should just take a few seconds. Okay, so we can close that and close the installer. And then let's go ahead and run the, extent, the extension pack. This will open VirtualBox. It'll ask us if we want to install and we just go ahead and accept that legal agreement. And once again, add our administrator password for the Mac. And that was successfully installed. Okay, so now that we've installed VirtualBox, let's go ahead and create a virtual machine. Let's select New and give the virtual machine a suitable name, like Ubuntu Server. We will accept the default as Linux for the operating system type, although we could choose Windows, Solaris, BSD, etc. And we'll accept Ubuntu 64-bit as the default version. Click continue. Um, we can use the, def the default amount of memory that's available, that's, um, that's uh, displayed here. If you wanted to check how much memory you have available on your Mac, you go to the Apple icon, you click on about this Mac, and then you can see in the memory tab that you have 16 gigabytes of RAM memory available. And in the storage tab, you can see that there's over 400 gigabytes of disk memory available. So once we know that, we can go ahead and click continue. Next, we need to create a virtual hard disk, which will be used to install the operating system. And we will accept the default VDI VirtualBox disk image format and click continue. Next step, we will change to fixed size disk. And we will change this default from 8 gig to 12 and click create. So this process takes about a minute and a half to create the virtual disk. So about another 30 seconds remaining. Okay, so that's completed. Now let's just go in and change one setting that we need to change on the network settings. Click on the network tab and change the addressing scheme from NAT 
to bridged adapter. So what this means is that the adapter will get an IP address on the same network as the Mac instead of using NAT. So let's click OK on that and we're ready to go ahead with the installation of Linux. OK, so now that we've got the virtual machine configuration done, let's go ahead, go ahead and start the installation. We're going to need a, an installed CD or DVD and we select the ISO image that we downloaded earlier in our downloads directory. So that's effectively a virtual DVD and then we click on start. So what's happening now is we've got the installer screen from Ubuntu. We're going to use the, the keyboard for this installation. So we use the up arrow key, down arrow, left, right and, and enter key. So we can move up and down using the arrow keys and we select install Ubuntu server and press enter. We can minimize this window here just so that we have a single window on the screen. Okay, so the desired language for the installer is going to be English, so we accept that as the default. The location will be used to set our time zone as well, so let's make sure that we get the time zone correct. So I go to other, select Europe, and then click down on Switzerland. Okay, there's no locale defined, so we're going to say United Kingdom, so I have English language. You can try to have your keyboard layout detected by pressing a series of keys, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to specify exactly the keyboard that I have, because I have a Swiss keyboard, and it's a Swiss-French keyboard. So now it's detecting the hardware or the virtual hardware, in fact, because we're using a virtual machine. And it's loading different drivers that are needed, etc., for the for the boot process. The entire installation time should take about 10 to 15 minutes. If the installation is taking a long time, I will fast forward through parts of the installation. So now it's configuring the network, automatically detecting uh, network settings from the local bridge network. And it's asking us for a host name. So let's give it a host name, Ubuntu server. You can't use spaces in the host name, but you can use a, a hyphen or a dash. Click the tab key and then press continue or enter for continue. So we need to add a user. I'm going to call the new user Woody. And call him Alan. The username will be Woody. Tab and press enter. And let's create a password for Woody. And we need to enter the password a second time. That's to make sure that we haven't made a mistake. Okay, we don't want to use encryption, although we could encrypt the home directory. Let's let's not do that. So we select no and continue. And it's detected the time zone as Zurich, and that's correct. So we press enter. Okay, so use entire disk and set up LVM. We won't use LVM for this installation. We'll just use a standard install without LVM. So if we select the first option and press enter. And it's asking us if, if we want to go ahead and, and format this hard disk. Well, there's only one, so we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so it's telling us now what it's going to do to the disk. It's going to create a swap partition, an ex, uh, an ext4 partition on SDA2, on SDA, excuse me. So we finish partitioning and write to disk. 
write changes to disk, yes. So now it's copying the install files to disk. So it's installing the kernel at the moment. Okay, it's asking us if we need a, a proxy to get some updates on the internet, so we don't need a proxy, we can just skip this. So now it's doing updates. And it's asking us if we want to use automatic updates or not. So we will install security updates automatically and click press enter. Okay, it's asking us what we want to install as services. And I would say that we should install the OpenSSH server and not install the system utilities. Click continue. So we're nearly, nearly finished installing the software. We're nearly finished. So it's just cleaning up temporary files at this stage. And in a minute it should reboot. So now it's installing the boot part of the installation. And it's asking us if we want to install the bootloader on the master boot record. So we just accept that and, and select yes. Okay, so it says the installation is complete and it's going to ask us to reboot and remove this, the CD DVD. Let's click on continue. And the system should boot up and we should get a login prompt. So you can see the diagnostic messages during the boot process. And here we are at our login prompt, so the installation has been successful. Thank you for watching today's video. Just to recap, we downloaded and installed two programs, VirtualBox and Ubuntu Linux. We used VirtualBox to generate a VM, a virtual machine, running Ubuntu Linux. We booted up the VM just to prove that it was running properly and for the next video we will use that VM so make sure that you remember the username and password that you created. Hi, yesterday we saw how we could build a Linux virtual machine using VirtualBox and Ubuntu Linux. Today what I'm going to do is show you how you can easily log into this VM remotely and carry out very basic and standard system administration tasks. So I hope you enjoy today's lesson. Okay, once we've finished setting up the VM, we're happy that it's working. We can click on the virtual box console window and log in as Woody. Okay, now that we're logged in, we might want to check the network settings and we can do that using the if config command with a switch minus a. You can see that we have two network cards. This one is a virtual ethernet provided by virtual box. And this one is called the local loopback adapter, which is not important to us at this at this stage. So if you if you just note the IP address of your network card, it should be 
something like 10.1.1.28 or you may have a 192.168 address. So make a note of that address <clears throat> and then minimize your um, console window and go, on, go ahead and open a Mac terminal. What we want to do now is SSH space, sorry, Woody at 10.1.1.28 or whatever the address was on your network card. We are prompted for Woody's password and once we put in the correct password you can see that we're logged in correctly to the same console that we had previously on VirtualBox or at least we can do the same things in, in the SSH session as we can on the console. So a few simple commands we can go through now would be who am I for example which tells us what our username is. Um, you can also use the who command to see who is logged in. So you can see that Woody's logged in twice. This login is on the VirtualBox console and this login is on the Mac terminal. Okay. You can also use a df-k command to look at the disks and the disk partitions. So that's our root disk partition which is on SDA1 and then we have a swap partition in addition which would normally be on SDA2. Another command we can use is pwd which shows us the home directory or which directory we're actually in at the moment and we can use a cd command to change directory. So this command would change us to the root directory. And if we press PWD again, we can see that we're now in the root directory. If we do CD slash home slash Woody, then we're back in Woody's home directory. Okay, so in, in this session we've covered how to log in remotely with SSH and we've covered how to check our IP address and finally a few very basic commands. Okay, now that we're able to log in remotely, the next thing I'm going to show you is how to change passwords and how to remove users. First of all, to validate who we're logged in as, we need to use the command who am I? You can see that it it says that we're Woody, which is obviously who we're logged in as. We can now change Woody's password using two different options. Just this command by itself, P A W S W D. It asks for the current password and then the new password. We've had to put the password in twice, the new one, so that it just makes sure that we don't make a mistake. And it obviously has changed the password because we get a message saying password updated successfully. Now let's say we want to use the other method. We can change somebody else's password, for example, by specifying the actual user. Now this time I'm going to make a mistake in the password, so I'm going to add the new password. But make sure that on the second entry I, I, I make a mistake so it's they don't match. So you can see sorry passwords do not match. So effectively you need to make sure that when you change a password that you put in the same password for those two prompts. So adding users is very simple. You need to use the sudo command uh, to get administrator privileges. Then add user. And let's call this user Grover. We're asked for Woody's password because we're getting Woody is getting administrator privileges to do this particular operation. And here we're being prompted for a, a new password for. Grover. 
and again. Okay, it's asking for the full name. So everybody's called Smith, I think, these days. <coughs> we type Y for yes at the end. Let's add another user. And a password for Big Bird. Big Bird's full name. And Y for yes. So how can we tell if we've added those users? Well, we look in a file called pawswd in the directory slash etc. And you can see that at the bottom of the file, at the bottom of the file we have two new users and just below where Woody is. So that's how you add users. If you want to remove those users, you need to use a sudo uh, keyword in front of the user now. Big bird. And the user has been deleted. However, the user's data has not been deleted and I'll show you why. First of all, Let's look at the password file. You can see that Big Bird has been deleted, but Grover is still there. So if we go to the home directory where all users have their data stored, we can see that we still have a directory here, which was actually Big Bird's home directory, but now nobody owns that directory. So in order to remove Big Bird completely, we need to use the rm command, minus recursive, capital R, for recursive, big bird. And we're being asked here if we want to remove each file. In fact, we didn't use the sudo keyword, so we don't have permission to remove that directory. This time it worked, so we need to make sure we use sudo when we're working on other users um, files and directories and accounts. So let's now remove Grover's account. We need to use sudo again. If we ls minus al we see that Grover's home directory is still there. So if we use sudo rm minus recursive and then Grover then his home directory is removed as well. We can also just double check the password file to make sure that Grover and Big Bird have been removed. And there you can see that they're both removed and Woody is the last user in the file. So that's how you change passwords and how you add and remove users. Okay, finally, I'm going to show you how to edit a simple file and how to update and upgrade the system. First of all, let's go back to our own home directory, which is Woody's directory. And to edit a file, we need to use the keyword vi and then the name of the file. Press enter. Vi has two modes, command mode and editing mode. And now we're in command mode, so we can insert text by pressing the i key once and then adding the text. Okay, so let's say we want to save that text. We need to go back to command mode by using the escape key and then to save it, colon wq. So now if we ls the home directory, we can see that we do have a file called test.txt, which is 54 bytes. We can cat that file, which shows us the contents. If we want to edit that file again, we use the same command, and then we go to where we want to insert the text, and we put in the text. Let's say that we want to repeat some text, we can copy that text with Control C, Control V, Enter, Control V, Enter, Control V, Enter. 
escape colon wq if we cat the file now you can see that the new text is in there to edit the file use the same command vi test.txt this time if we want to delete three lines we can push the number three and the letter d twice so that removes three lines escape colon wq saves the file again if we type cat the file name you can see that we now have the edited version okay so finally I want to show you how to update the system and upgrade the system again you need to be sudo administrator for that so use a sudo command and we use the apt get command to do the updates so the update simply synchronizes the index of packages locally so that we know which packages are available for update or upgrade so that's being done so now we use a similar command but this time upgrade and you can see that it's found that some packages need to be upgraded and it's asking us if we would like to use the additional disk space so we type y for yes okay so now the packages have been downloaded the updates can take place And as you can see, the upgrades have now completed. So once more, let's do an update to synchronize again the index with the local files. And once again, let's run an upgrade and see if there's anything to be upgraded. So you can see that one package has been kept back, which we could install manually, but in this case, we're not going to do that. So upgrading your system is quite important for two reasons. One is to make sure that you're not vulnerable to security vulnerabilities. And the second one is to make sure that you don't have any bugs that cause system performance issues, etc. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Just to recap what we covered, Today we looked at how to log in remotely to the Linux system and secondly how to carry out standard day-to-day -day management tasks on that virtual machine. All that you need to do now really is practice those commands and before long you'll be comfortable managing a typical Linux server.